Welcome to the Weekly Scroll, sharing biblical thoughts on current events. Scroll through today's top headlines with Bill Cloud as he unravels the political and spiritual implications of the world we live in, all through the lens of Scripture. Now, be encouraged, be challenged, and be ready. Welcome again to the Weekly Scroll. Today, the day we are filming this, is the 9th of Av, a very ominous day in Israeli history. And on this day, we're still waiting to see whether or not Iran is going to back up its pledge to retaliate against Israel in response to recent assassinations of key terror figures. The world seems to believe that they mean business, and they're not taking this as an idle threat. For instance, the U.S. Defense Department has recently ordered the USS Abraham Lincoln Carrier Strike Group, equipped with the latest F-35 fighters to the Middle East, adding to the capabilities already present and provided by the USS Theodore Roosevelt Carrier Strike Group. In addition to that, the Defense Department announced that a guided missile submarine, the USS Georgia, has also been ordered to the Middle East. And all of this activity, says the U.S. uh, Secretary of Defense, is to reinforce the commitment to, and I quote, take every possible step to defend Israel. European powers, France, Germany, and the United Kingdom issued a joint statement this past Monday warning Iran and its allies to, quote, refrain from attacks that would further escalate regional tensions, end quote, as they believe these escalations seem to be heading toward a breaking point. Now, as for Iran, along with its proxies in different areas, including Lebanon or Hezbollah in Lebanon, they have threatened to launch a coordinated attack against Israel that they say would last for several days. In response to that, Israel has vowed to go all out to defend itself and to eliminate the threat against them. And if that were to happen... It could, and I want to repeat that word, could, launch events that have biblical ramifications. For instance, though a lot of eschatologists believe that the present circumstances are setting the stage for the war that is described in Ezekiel 38 and 9, the war of Gog of the land of Magog, as I see it, the stage is probably being set for other wars that occur before that climactic battle. Personally, what I believe is events that are described in Ezekiel 35 and Ezekiel 36, Isaiah 17, the book of Obadiah, which is collectively a decisive war against Edom. And it might even include uh, things that are described that happen in Lebanon and Syria. In other words, there might be a more um, lesser war in, in relation to Ezekiel 38 and 9, but nevertheless, um, a very decisive war and one that is very prophetic. That, if it happened, could in turn set in motion the confederation of nations. It could incite those nations in response to the destruction of Hezbollah and Hamas and uh, all these different things that are hinted at in Ezekiel 35, 36, Isaiah 17, the destruction of Damascus, Obadiah, all these things. In other words, it might incite what is described in Ezekiel 38 and 9. That's just my view anyway. Now, where Ezekiel 38 and 9 are concerned, as a reminder, those nations are led by Gog of the land of Magog, who is the chief prince of Meshech and Tuval, whoever that is or wherever that is. But Gog comes into the land of Israel along with Persia, which is Iran. Ethiopia, some believe that means Sudan, Gomer, Libya. Gomer, by the way, is part of modern-day Turkey in that, that area, that region. And then it mentions the house of Turgarma, uh, Tugarma, which is also believed to be referring to Turkey. That's interesting because Turkey's possible involvement with this future invasion has become a lot more interesting recently because the president of Turkey— has threatened to use military force against Israel. Speaking to members of his governing party in July, President Erdogan said, quote, we must be very strong so that Israel cannot do these things to Palestine. Just as we entered Karabakh, 
just as we entered Libya, we might do the same to them. There is nothing we cannot do, end quote. As a footnote to that, currently, Turkey is a member of NATO and then, technically speaking, considered to be an ally of the United States. The Bible does say that this invasion comes from the north, actually from the far north, which is why many eschatologists believe that Russia is going to be involved. In some translations, in fact, it, it describes Gog as being the prince of Rosh, which some people think is uh, phonetically related to Russia. Now, as far as that, we'll have to wait and see. But I do believe that it is interesting that Putin of Russia has made his position known in the present situation. He's made it clear that he intends to stand along a side of Iran in this present conflict. And not only that, let's not forget that Russia is currently embroiled in a war with Ukraine, who, by the way, recently made an incursion into Russia. That's uh, an invasion uh, or an incursion that sparked the evacuations of about 200,000 people along a 25-mile front. And why are these two nations at war? Because Russia's Putin obviously wishes to expand and solidify his power and influence in the region, and maybe even beyond that region. Now, I don't expect the War of Gog of Magog to be the next one. I could be wrong. I might be proven wrong. I'm just not expecting it. Rather, I'm of the view that other conflicts in the region may be the next big event, which in turn sets the stage for the bigger event, the one described in chapters 38 and 9. It might be that the current tension is going to lead to the destruction of, of Hezbollah and Hamas. In other, word, in other words, the most immediate threat to Israel at this point, that is the one that is on their doorstep. It might be that if Israel moves against Hezbollah in strength, Iran may decide to let Hezbollah take the brunt of any Israeli offensive. These are all speculations, and we'll just have to wait and see. But it makes the point that times are changing. Times are getting very interesting. In fact, as it relates to Ezekiel 38 and 9, and the way I've presented one scenario to you, I think it's interesting because, number one, when the invasion of Ezekiel 38 and 9 does actually occur, Iran, Persia, is definitely a part of it. Number two, Syria and Lebanon, regions that provide shelter for the immediate threat in the north, that is Hezbollah, are not mentioned. And why is that? So whether or not the ongoing developments in the Middle East are the opening stages of what is described in Ezekiel, whether it's in chapters 35 and 6, or whether it's what's described in chapters 38 and 9, we'll have to wait and see. There are other threats to Israel that, at least in the mind of, uh, of some Israelis, is just as great as what we see taking place in Iran today. In fact, in a recent opinion piece, the editor of the, of the Jerusalem Post, speaking of the upcoming election in the U.S., said this, This election is not just another political choice. It is a life or death decision that can literally affect the existence of the Jewish state. The stakes could not be higher. Harris's presidency could lead to policies that embolden Israel's enemies and weaken the U.S.-Israel alliance, posing an existential threat to the Jewish state, end quote. That's according to an Israeli. And considering that Israel is the focus of God's attention as it relates to the nations, all these threats toward Israel tells us that times are, well, prophetic, and that times are changing. Changing Clearly, the world is transitioning from one season to another. It's as Solomon said, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, which means that every season has a reason. There's a purpose tied to each season, and that purpose is always to advance God's agenda in the earth. And so then, as we enter into a different season, it's very important that as God's people, we discern what that season is. In other words, if it's the season to plant, then we should not be plucking up, and vice versa. 
If it's the season to gather stones, as Solomon says, we shouldn't be scattering stones. Or if the time has come to break down certain things in this world, we shouldn't be trying to prop them back up. If the season is meant for war, then it will not be a season of peace. And if we have lived in a season when we, as the people of God, kept silent, perhaps the season has come for us to speak out. We must discern the season and then work in tandem with the purpose of God. It is written that the sons of Issachar had understandings of the time and knew what Israel ought to do. Without going too deep into a word study, what it's saying here, or at least implying, is that the sons of Issachar could correctly advise the people of God what to do. And it was based on what they observed from the Word of God, coupled with the understanding of principles and patterns that were established by past events. Which brings us back to something else, Solomon said. That which is has already been, and what is to be has already been. It's recorded in Matthew's Gospel that certain religious men came to Yeshua to test him and to ask him to give them a sign that would prove that he was the promised Messiah. His answer to them was this. When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. My translation of that is this. Anyone who is insightful enough to forecast tomorrow's weather should be wise enough to look at what is going on around you and determine what it means in terms of what God is doing in the earth. And consequently, what do we need to do in order to prepare for it and to work in concert with it? And so if signs that we see today are threatening, then we should consider that the season we're in may not be meant for peace. In short, Messiah was telling these people that what they observed around them should convince them that the promised Messiah and the birth pangs that precede it are at hand. And so then if we're seeing these things in our time, these threatening signs, things, by the way, that Messiah foretold us would happen as days of, rege of redemption drew nearer, then perhaps we should conclude that these events are the footsteps of the Messiah. He is nearer today than he was yesterday. And the closer we get, the more intense and the more frequent will be the birth pangs that declare his soon return. Now, I know that we've heard all of this before. Every generation interprets events as signs of the times and harbingers of the Messiah's immediate return. And so why should we think that today is any different than it was 10 years ago, 50 years ago, 80 years ago? In fact, I can hear some of the scoffers already saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Well, first of all, I want to take note that this passage from Peter's letter was written 2,000 years ago. In other words, 2,000 years ago, Peter was always, already raising the issue that there are going to be people who come and scoff, and they're going to mock the idea that Messiah is going to return. And yet, even though it was 2,000 years ago, Peter's warning God's people in every generation not to adopt this mindset. A skeptical attitude toward prophetic indicators, those signs that are given to us to provoke us to wake up and be on the alert, to ignore those things or to be skeptics about those things sets a trap for those who are unwilling to believe that God will, at the appointed time, require an account from men and from nations. It's a snare that wicked and lazy servants can stumble into because maybe they're believing that my master is delaying his coming. And then, falling into this snare, they're caught, they're found carousing with drunkards in a day when they did not expect their master's return. So to sum that up, those who mock and ignore the promise of his coming are deceived. And avoiding deception is one of the things 
one of the primary things, in fact, that Yeshua said that you and I were to be aware of in these last days. In fact, of all the different signs that he said would point to his coming, chief among them is deception, falsehood, lies. These things would manifest in the last days, and they would infest mankind. And so he said, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. Now, to be clear, he wasn't saying that men would come claiming to be Messiah themselves. Now, that has happened, obviously. But what he was saying is that many would come saying that Yeshua is the Messiah, but would nevertheless deceive many people. And so why would this not be the primary issue at the last days? Deceit is why Eve ate the forbidden fruit in the beginning. And deceit and lies and falsehood has proven to be the most effective tool the adversary has in his arsenal. And because it has been successful throughout history, he's going to continue using lies, falsehood, deception in order to bring destruction to countless numbers of people. In fact, the prophet Daniel said that the one we refer to as the Antichrist would arise in the last days and, quote, cast truth down to the ground, end quote. Not only is he going to do this, but Daniel said that he would prosper in it. Paul said that with lying signs and wonders, this lawless one would cause many to be deceived and that they would perish because of it. In fact, he says they will perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. We'll put it this way. While many will remain focused on the prospect of wars, rumors of wars, etc., as signs of the times, Messiah clearly stated that these issues were only the beginning of sorrows and that the greater and far more deadly threat was the deception that many would fall victim to. And this being understood, I can't help but mention the unbelievable demonstrations of blatant and obvious falsehood and lies and misinformation that is part of our world today. Everything from men can have babies, or there are an infinite number of genders, or murder of the innocent is a right. Hamas is not a terror organization. They're a political movement. It goes on and on, and it's mind-boggling. But even worse than that is the fact that so many people buy into it. They consume it. They decide to live with it. And even worse, some propagate it. I'm of the opinion that even some who don't really believe these ridiculous fables, but they repeat them anyway because it's to their own personal advantage and benefit. You know, people like politicians who will say whatever they need to say depending on who they're talking to at that particular moment, even though it may contradict something they said that to another group just a few months or years before, maybe even weeks or days. Why? Because they want to hold positions of influence and power. So it amazes me to see the litany of lies that are being presented, not only throughout the world, but to bring it closer to home here in America, and particularly by those who are seeking, seeking political office, seeking high office. Now, I realize that politicians have always done this to a certain degree, but I have to say that I've never witnessed the brazenness that is on parade today just the blatant lies, telling lies when the liar should know good and well that the lie is going to be disproven very quickly. Now, I guess it could be because they've told the lie so often that they've come to believe it themselves. They've told so many people that they carried a weapon into war for so long that somehow, somehow the lie dislodged reality from their memory. Now, that's purely Hypothetical example, of course. Yet, even when these people are caught in their lie, they will stonewall, or they'll try to convince others that believing their lying eyes is a sign of ignorance, or that they themselves are the ones who are deceived, or that they're just somehow low-information voters. On one hand, it is shocking to see that so many people will quickly believe things that are simply not true. And on the other hand, 
you and I shouldn't be surprised because it is a sign of the day in which we live, a sign when I believe strong delusion is being sent upon those who, as the Bible says, did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness and consequently believed the lie and will be condemned. There's one other element of this end-time deception, uh, deception that I want to revisit and I want to highlight. Remember, Messiah said that many would come claiming that he, Yeshua, that he was the Messiah, but who would nevertheless deceive many people. In other words, there would be those who claim to follow him, but who would nevertheless lead others to believe things that weren't true, and even worse, bring the listener closer to destruction. In that vein of thought, it is very important that you and I not be led astray in any way, not by those claiming to be followers of Messiah, because some will say they're a follower of Messiah out of one side of their mouth, uh, one side of their mouth, but then propose to advance wicked agendas with the other side of their mouth. Now, perhaps it's apples and oranges when compared to what the Messiah was referring to, but I recently read an article that demonstrates one of the main threats that I feel like you and I need to be on guard against. Case in point, a New York Times columnist who identified as being pro-life and, quote, an evangelical conservative, wrote that a democratic victory was the only way to, quote, save conservatism, end quote. Again, to save conservatism, it was necessary that there be a democratic victory, so says this evangelical conservative. This man is saying that to support radical progressivism and out-of-control liberalism, to give them the reins of power is the only way to preserve the nation's future. That's what he's saying. Ironically, he also stated that, quote, lying is wrong. I am not naive. I know that politicians have had poor reputations for honesty since Athens, but I have never seen a human being lie with the intensity and sheer volume of Donald Trump, end quote. Okay, so he believes Trump lies, and maybe Trump has lied about some things, and I won't deny that. He has certainly said things that, in my view, should not have been said. But the point is, in this writer's mind, he is taking a moral stand against lying by voting for Harris and Walls, who are what? Bastions of truth? Really? In my view, this man is deceived. And what's dangerous is, because of his position of influence, he might deceive others. And this is what I'm getting at. This is the principle that Yeshua conveyed to us when he said that we to, should take heed that we are not deceived. In other words, just because someone claims to be a believer, someone claims that Yeshua is the Messiah, doesn't mean that they won't participate in the deception. Now, as a citizen of this nation, if you want to cast your ballot and decide to vote for Harris and Walls, that's your business. Now, for the record, I will not. But if you do that, don't tell me that you're putting biblical principles above all other issues. Don't tell me that voting for them is not an endorsement of, or at least a willingness to tolerate, ungodly principles and radical positions. Don't tell me that enabling their defense and celebration of abortion or so-called LGBTQ plus rights, their preference for anti-Israel organizations, some of them with terrorist sympathies, and their propensity for lawlessness and the chaos that goes with it, don't tell me that it is justified and that somehow you are taking the moral high ground just because you believe their opponent to be crass and prone to lie. That's just ridiculous. In effect, this writer is saying that he wants to save the house by throwing gas on a kitchen fire so as to hasten its destruction. How ludicrous and how misguided is that? And then to suggest that such a position is motivated by a desire to restore what is good, that is simply bizarre, and in my opinion, wicked in and of itself. 
to propose that people who desire to see goodness and some semblance of righteousness restored can accomplish that by supporting what is obviously and blatantly evil is nonsensical and misguided at the very least. At its worst, it's a lie. And as believers, you and I should never influence others to embrace evil in order to advance good. Paul said that we are to not be overcome by evil, but we are to overcome evil with good. So then, frankly, if we have an opportunity to take a stand against abortion, that's good. If we can take a stand against lawlessness, that's good. If we can promote and enforce the notion that boundaries bring order to chaos, that's good. If we can attempt to promote peace through strength, that is good. If we can have the unrestrained liberty to advance the logic and common sense that is the truth, God's truth, that is good. To think that we can attain these things by supporting those who actively work against these values is foolish. Now, some will interpret what I'm saying to mean that I'm trying to convince you how to vote. I am not. You don't want to vote for Trump or any Republicans or conservatives so be it. You want to vote for liberals and Democrats? That's your business. I hope I've made it clear that my vote is for his righteousness, God's standards of holiness, and for advancing the kingdom of heaven. And so that being said, I will continue to repeat that I don't believe any man, any woman, any party, or any political philosophy can save me or this nation. Salvation is of the Lord. The only righteousness is his righteousness. The only truth is his truth. As it is written, let God be true, but every man a liar. Men have lied and deceived from the beginning. Cain is the first on record. But as we approach Messiah's return, falsehood will abound, along with lawlessness, because these two go hand in hand. To transgress the law of God is to oppose the truth, and in a sense, cast truth to the ground, where then its opponents have opportunity to trample it underfoot. And so that being said, truth and those who stand for it, those who stand on it, those who proclaim it will be amplified in these last days. Just as darkness accentuates a light, so too does an abundance of lies and deceit accentuate the truth. And so if we are going to be able to resist the falsehood in the last days, If we are going to be committed not to be deceived, then we must know the truth. And so I'll close with this thought and a familiar passage. Just as certainly as the unrest in Europe, in the Middle East, and here in the United States is evidence that we are living in the days that Messiah spoke of, so too is the ever-expanding reach and influence of falsehood and deception that so many willingly, foolishly, perhaps ignorantly embrace the lies is further proof that the coming of the Messiah is at hand. And so as a friend of mine likes to say, if we listen to these things, we can hear Messiah's footsteps as he approaches. And in light of that fact, as his ambassadors, as those who are commissioned to prepare the way of the Lord, we must be guided by the spirit of truth for our sake, and for the sake of so many others who are imprisoned by the web of deceit. Yeshua said, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to get the latest updates from Bill, and check out other podcasts available from Jacob's Tent. And join us next week on... The Weekly Scroll.